Do you think the world abandoned Afghanistan? Unfortunately, the world uh, did abandon Afghanistan, although uh, the Afghan forces uh, bravely fought to defend uh, Afghanistan on the one hand and also to help ensure regional peace and security and international uh, peace and security on the uh, other. Remember that we lost over 75,000 Afghan forces in this uh, war against uh, extremism, terrorism, and uh, narcotics production and uh, trafficking. So uh, that's the last word. Don't forget the Afghan people. Don't forget the suffering of the Afghan people. Don't forget that uh, we uh, lost uh, 250,000 people, 1 million wounded, 500,000 recently displaced, overall 5 million protracted uh, internally displaced people, 3.5 up to 4 million Afghans uh, refugees uh, around the world. The world just watched as disturbing events unfolded in Afghanistan, a country that has faced war and uncertainty for decades. A deep sense of fear spread among the Afghan people as the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan. And the world just watched as foreign troops led by the United States decided to withdraw its troops from the country after having occupied Afghanistan for nearly two decades. Welcome everyone, you're watching Conversations with Alanki. In today's episode, I will be in conversation with the Ambassador of Afghanistan to Sri Lanka, M. Ashraf Hyderi. Welcome to the conversation and thank, thank you. you so much for saying yes. Thanks. Um, Mr. Hyderi, the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan after the U.S. troops withdrew from Afghanistan. And U.S. President Joe Biden said that Afghanistan should fight on its own. Do you think the world abandoned Afghanistan? Unfortunately, the world uh, did abandon Afghanistan, although uh, the Afghan forces uh, bravely fought to defend uh, Afghanistan on the one hand, and also to help ensure regional peace and security and international uh, peace and security on the uh, other. Remember that we lost over 75,000 Afghan forces in this uh, war against uh, extremism, terrorism, and uh, narcotics production and uh, trafficking, three intertwined uh, threats that uh, destabilize the region and as well as undermine international peace and uh, security. But unfortunately, because our forces over -re relied on the key military enablers, including close air support, logistics, maintenance, those were removed and withdrawn as the Biden administration announced about three months ago that they would withdraw by the end of uh, August, which just uh, happened yesterday. As a result, uh, our forces, uh, fortunately, couldn't uh, keep up with the fight as, as well as they did uh, in the past. And there were other factors that also contributed to, you know, the collapse uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Afghan government and the answer of the Taliban. Remember that the Taliban had escalated uh, violence uh, over the past five years and then even more so over the past two years since the initiation by the U.S. Uh, to enter peace talks with the Taliban, excluding the Afghan government, and then negotiating and signing a withdrawal uh, agreement, not necessarily a peace agreement. Remember that the Taliban committed, you know, to uh, reducing violence and committing to a ceasefire and preventing over 7,000 uh, or so prisoners um, that included uh, drug traffickers and terrorists from returning to the battlefield and as well as uh, severing uh, ties with uh, uh, regional and global uh, terrorist networks. Uh, while the Afghan government fielded a, an inclusive uh, a negotiating team and send them repeatedly to Doha and they've been living in Doha for the sake of making the peace process work consistent with the commitments that the U.S. and the Taliban made and we made an unprecedented concession by releasing those uh, prisoners you know to demonstrate our willingness uh, on behalf of the Afghan people which authorized the release of those prisoners to make the peace process uh, work not of which unfortunately materialized simply because the United States was intent on withdrawing their forces regardless of you know, what uh, could take place as a consequence. And we have seen over the past uh, three, four weeks uh, since the fall of Kabul or prior to that, even the fall of you know, different provinces and provincial districts and uh, provincial capitals, 
uh, what has unfolded, uh, which is uh, you know a clear, unfortunately, consequence of the betrayal of Afghanistan and betrayal of the Afghan people and betrayal of the you know, the past 20 years of gains in democracy and human rights and women's rights and uh, um, uh, reconstruction and development uh, of Afghanistan in terms of connectivity um, uh, internally and as well as connecting with the neighborhood, not only to you know, facilitate business and investment in Afghanistan, but also to facilitate business and investment and uh, trade across uh, the region uh, as one of our key foreign policy goals uh, to you know, um, uh, realize our status as a land bridge between South Asia and Central Asia, even to benefit you know, far neighbors like uh, Sri Lanka, which is uh, you know, a member state of the SARC and as well as an extended uh, uh, neighbor. So uh, the right vision, the right mission goals, uh, right achievements of the past 20 years, but unfortunately uh, international support discontinued in a way that the Afghan people, the Afghan government had not expected, even the Taliban did not expect it, and as well as the rest of the region. Do you think U.S. President Biden foresaw that the Taliban would take over once they withdrew their troops from Afghanistan? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there was a, a Wall Street Journal which uh, uh, discussed an intelligence uh, uh, estimate report uh, saying that the Afghan government could collapse uh, in about six months without the key military enablers, which I pointed out, without the continued presence of a residual force, uh, including U.S. NATO, to continue supporting the Afghan forces on the one hand, and as well as the Afghan state and the uh, peace process, which I uh, discussed. So that was very much foreseen, and the uh, president of the U.S. very much was aware of that. There's so much chaos seen at the Kabul airport. What happens to the thousands of Afghans who want to evacuate? Oh, well, many thousands were evacuated, but there were many more thousands who were uh, outside trying to get out either because of you know, credible threats to their lives or fear of persecution, simply because they don't know whether the Taliban would actually deliver on their assurances of you know, uh, general amnesty or, uh, or not. So those people uh, are uh, stranded. Those people are still in Afghanistan, but let's see. What relief do you expect for the Afghan people from Afghanistan's allies and from organizations such as the United Nations? Well, the Afghan people have expected a lot from the United Nations, but unfortunately the United Nations uh, is also relying on the support of the member states as an intergovernmental organization. That said, the United Nations uh, Secretariat uh, operating and led by the, uh, uh, the Secretary General uh, could have done a lot more. Uh, for example, the UN Secretary General could have visited Afghanistan over the past three months, A, to you know, encourage and persuade and pressure even using the powers of uh, his uh, secretariat and his connections and contacts with the you know, United Nations Security Council and the General Assembly and of course with the world leaders uh, to uh, you know, draw more attention uh, to the importance of uh, making the Afghan peace process uh, work on the one hand and also to draw attention to uh, the consequences if the Afghan peace process is stalled and failed, while on the other hand to uh, draw attention to the expanding complex humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan affecting 18 plus uh, million uh, people and as well as recent uh, internally displaced people by the extremely violent uh, offensives of, uh, of the Taliban and, and, and counter uh, offensives uh, and, and defense. Uh, as a result, uh, I think more could have been done by the Secretariat and, and drawing more attention, uh, even as we speak today. For example, the United Nations has about $1.3 billion in outstanding humanitarian appeal, but 40% of which has been met. Here, the UN Secretary General could have played an active role uh, to help this appeal meet its uh, you know, goal of raising that amount, knowing that you know, the situation in Afghanistan was only getting worse and is getting worse as we speak and will get worse in the days and weeks and months uh, to come, simply because the state has collapsed, the you know, economy has uh, collapsed, uh, banks are all closed, there's no money in the banks. The uh, last airport, which was Kabul, is now even 
It doesn't have an air uh, tower that can operate at the airport, which means Afghanistan is disconnected until it is reconnected. So all of that has you know, direct uh, impact on the day-to-day -day, uh, survival and uh, you know, p uh, and life of uh, ordinary uh, citizens of Afghanistan. So the UN Secretary, could have, uh, Secretary General could have done a lot more. What is the most pressing issue that Afghans face today? Pressing issue is, of course, first, uh, I would say, both human security and pr protective security, human security, everything that, you know, other ordinary citizens of other countries uh, uh, need, uh, basically, uh, shelter, mm -hmm. food, water, sanitation, uh, those basics of, uh, you know, uh, survival, and then, of course, sustainable uh, livelihoods, uh, as basic as they uh, could be, uh, which are missing. And... And then uh, also protective security, and you know, security uh, uh, from fear and fear of persecution and even threats to their lives. Um, so uh, that's uh, what you know the Afghan people are unfortunately facing today. And do you think Afghanistan would be stronger if the international community stands together and supports Afghanistan? Absolutely, yes. I mean, the international community is morally obligated because the situation in Afghanistan is not as a result of you know, uh, internal tensions or a civil war, which has never been uh, the case, which is quite what mis you know, misperceived and misinterpreted, and also it's much due to, you know, external propaganda that, uh, that there has been a civil war in Afghanistan for decades, or, you know, now there's a civil war uh, breaking out. No, the Afghan people are not uh, at war with one another. The Afghan people very much cherish the freedoms that they gained and, you know, work together to institutionalize them over the past 20 years. Uh, unfortunately, the insecurity uh, and violence and war and all the conflicts and battles that we have seen have been very much externally based and very much externally imposed uh, on the uh, Afghan people. Given the current situation, what, how do you think a lasting and meaningful solution can be found for Afghanistan? Well, there are many solutions. Uh, it all depends on uh, the extent to which the international, international community is willing to act on the words of consensus they often express. You know, often you go to these meetings and, you know, uh, sessions that happen at the uh, United Nations Security Council, many, many regional uh, conferences and trilaterals, quadrilaterals. There's a lot of consensus at the stable, peaceful, you know, Afghanistan is in uh, the best interest of uh, everyone. But how can you, you know, uh, make that happen? That happens when the uh, region and other extra regional stakeholders marry, at least for the sake of Afghans, once over the past 40 years to, you know, help now with the peace process, with the deformation of an inclusive representative uh, government, and on responding to this expanding uh, humanitarian crisis, and as well as uh, you know, helping Afghanistan on the long run stand on its own by simply capitalizing or enabling the Afghan people and enabling the establishment after you know, establishment of a, an inclusive and representative government to consolidate, to solidify, and sustain the gains of the past 20 years. And those gains are you know, very basic. Kids going to school, Women working, you know, across government uh, 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 and institutions. Women uh, working in the economy. Women being um, active in the society, very much like uh, you. Women in Sri Lanka. Women in the rest of South Asia. Women in Iran. Women in Pakistan. Women in uh, Central Asia. Because women, you are half of, you know, any society's uh, population. As a result, with that woman, it's impossible to see how Afghanistan could stabilize on the long run, both uh, economically and uh, otherwise. As a result, uh, in those three critical areas, the international community get, can get together, you know, uh, act on their consensus, and act on those, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, consensus uh, uh, tangibly. And you did say that it's very important that an inclusive government representative of the Afghan people um, is formed. Do you, do you see this happening? Do I see it's happening? Uh, we hope that it would happen. We hope, I mean, that there have been talks uh, by different parties, at least one side, uh, you know, uh, led by the former president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, 
and the chairman of the National uh, Reconciliation High Council, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, so they're, they're engaged and have been engaged in talks with the Taliban and, um, uh, and encouraged, of course, now uh, also by the UN Security Council, they just a special session on Afghanistan, again calling on the Taliban and others involved to form an inclusive and representative uh, government. And uh, that, that's where things stand. And let's see what, uh, whether they, that, that would materialize. You know, Sri Lanka faced a civil war that lasted for nearly three decades. What experience can you gather from Sri Lanka for Afghanistan uh, when you look at Sri Lanka's transition from war to peace? Well, we could uh, have learned and still could learn a lot from Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka has been very reluctant in terms of uh, getting engaged with countries like Afghanistan or even, uh, you know, reluctant and generally sharing their experiences with the rest of the world. Uh, so Sri Lanka is very much inward looking uh, as far as I've seen, because over the past uh, you know, few years, I've tried a lot to engage Sri Lanka um, economically, commercially, on any areas of uh, cooperation, pushing uh, for uh, cooperation across the government. Uh, I'm probably the only ambassador in Sri Lanka that despite the COVID-19 situation and government closures and, you know, there was a time because of, you know, political crisis and the Easter attacks and then the lame duck government and the elections, I've been able to sign, to initiate initial and sign 10 MOUs and agreements. Uh, while I know that uh, many countries have tried um, to do so, but uh, have not been able uh, to even, you know, get two, three MOUs or agreements signed. So uh, at, I, my, at my level, I've done uh, a lot, but uh, Sri Lanka has not been forthcoming, unfortunately, uh, even to the extent that Afghan citizens have not been able to, uh, you know, secure uh, basic tourist visas. Uh, you know that any bilateral relationship and uh, productivity uh, rests on the citizens of both countries uh, traveling to each other's countries, visiting, visiting each other's countries for either business or medical tourism or higher education tourism and so on and so forth. So it's almost impossible for an Afghan to get uh, a visa despite the fact that they have all the documents and uh, even your ambassador informed, and even that your embassy and ambassador uh, knows them and is uh, you know, assured that uh, no Afghan would go to Sri Lanka to stay there indefinitely, uh, but you know, for the purpose of uh, tourism, business, and exploring other opportunities such as higher education and so forth. So with that kind of uh, situation, I, it's hard to see how we can learn or you know, benefit from Sri Lanka's very you know, uh, effective and important war to peace uh, transition experience. That is truly disheartening. Well, moving on to um, the final question. What message would you like to convey to everyone who is watching this video now? Well, not to forget the Afghan people because at the end of the day, countries have come, you know, come and left, countries have betrayed and served their self-interest, beat them from the region because without support, in the vicinity of Afghanistan and the neighborhood of Afghanistan, there is no way that so many terrorist groups from the region and outside uh, could converge in Afghanistan and could turn Afghanistan into what it is, what it is today, unfortunately, a country without a state and a country without uh, an economy with you know, over 20 million uh, you know, of our people, uh, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, risking uh, starvation with 5 million and uh, immediate at risk of uh, starvation simply because they are, you know, on the streets of Kabul and parks, uh, completely exposed to the extremes of uh, weather, unfortunately also affected by, uh, at least now that at least violence is diminished by uh, climate impact and COVID-19. If you look at the images online, you see that there is no, uh, you know, unfortunately, protection uh, as well as treatment of uh, covid uh, uh, 19. There are probably uh, hundreds of Afghans, much like Sri Lanka. See, despite all the excellent measures and really well management of uh, the situation, uh, hundreds of Sri Lankans are dying a day and thousands are getting infected. Now, imagine what's happening in Afghanistan with that kind of uh, uh, situation. So this situation in Afghanistan is very much brought upon uh, the Afghan people by our own neighborhood, but also, as I uh, discussed in the beginning, by the uh, you know, uh, premature 
uh, departure of the international community, a colossal betrayal of the Afghan people and their you know, belief and embrace of uh, democracy, human rights, and women's rights, all these you know, democratic values that you uh, hear from many different countries, even in Sri Lanka, uh, that, that are uh, uh, you know, often discussed and talked about. So uh, that's the last word. Don't forget the Afghan people. Don't forget the suffering of the Afghan people. Don't forget that uh, we uh, lost uh, 250,000 people, 1 million wounded, 500 thousand recently displaced, overall 5 million protracted uh, internally displaced people, 3.5 up to 4 million Afghans uh, refugees uh, around the world, and on top of that state collapse and uh, economic collapse at a time when uh, COVID and uh, climate are ravaging uh, through uh, Afghanistan. So uh, if we forget the Afghan people in this kind of situation, uh, be assured that it would have implications for this uh, region, for South Asia, uh, and as well as Central Asia, for China, for Russia, for India, even all the way down to uh, Sri Lanka. Why Sri Lanka? Because Sri Lanka is already a uh, you know, transit country for drug trafficking. Sri Lanka itself is already a consuming uh, uh, country in terms of Afghan drugs uh, cultivated in areas controlled by uh, you know, the, uh, the Taliban. So let's not forget the Afghan people. Thank you very much for your time, Ambassador. Um, thank you, and I do believe this was a very meaningful and insightful conversation. Thank you once again thank for you. your time. What will be the plight of the Afghan people? What will the future hold for Afghanistan? We can only wait and hope that a lasting and meaningful solution will be found. Thank you for watching. Do stay tuned for the next episode, which will be up soon on my YouTube channel. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourselves.